Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe and do consider supporting the channel via PayPal or Patreon. You'll find the links in the video description. The Russian Grandmaster Yuri Averbach reached 100 years of age on the 8th of February this year, but he died a few months later on the 7th of May. And I want to celebrate his life uh, by showing you a couple of his games and talking a little bit about him as well. He was twice Soviet champion in 1954 and 1956. And he played against, well, so many world champions. He, he actually, remember, he, he told me that he actually played against Emmanuel Lasker in a simultaneous display when he was a teenager in Moscow in, in the mid-1930s. And, well, coming right up to date. Um, of course, he you know he met Magnus. Now I don't think he ever played against Magnus, but you know he he met Magnus as well. So that's quite a span in the 20th century and 21st century. He was an opening theoretician, developing systems that are st still in use today. I mean, notably the the Averbach system against the King's Indian, and and that's um, I'm going to show you that in the game that uh, we're going to look at in in a few moments. But actually, that wasn't his only contribution to openings. You know, he he worked with so many uh, strong Soviet players. He was an endgame expert. Um, the books that he published on King and Pawn endgames, Rook and Pawn endgames, and well, many other kind of endgames. They they're sitting in my bookshelf and have been since I was a teenager. I mean, they are classics. Uh, the absolute standard works on on many basic endgames and many complicated endgames as well. Uh, he was a noted study composer. He composed some beautiful studies, actually. He was a, a journalist. He was a magazine editor uh, of Shakhmatny Bulletin in, in the Soviet Union and Russia. He was very involved in chess politics, actually, very involved in the Soviet Chess Federation. And actually, I mean, I've, I've been reading his memoir, published by New in Chess, Centre Stage and Behind the Scenes, a personal memoir of a Soviet chess legend, Yuri Averbach. And, I mean, some of the stories are just extraordinary. It shows you the, the, the machinations in the Soviet Chess Federation and in FIDE as well. He was an arbiter. I still remember him. Um, I, when I visited World Championship match in Moscow in 1985, and when there was a sort of big buzz in the crowd, he would come to the front of the stage and sort of calm people down, you know, ask people to calm down. He was after for the World Championship match in London in 1993, and I think in 2000 as well, actually. Certainly in 93. Uh, he was also a trainer. You know, he assisted many of the strongest players in the Soviet Union. Um, notably, he played many training games against Botvinnik in the 1950s, secret training games. And from these games, Botvinnik developed, for example, his trademark system against uh, with the English, with c4 and kingside fianchetto, and then e4 and e3 as well, and with knight e2. And... Yeah, talking to him, he was rightly proud of his contribution um, to Soviet chess and what Soviet chess had, had done for world chess as well. Um, I was fortunate to um, play against him and, um, you know, I met him on several occasions and had some, and interviewed him as well, and had some really nice conversations with him. I have to say, I liked him a lot, just on a personal level. So what I'd like to do is show you a, a classic game of Yuri Averbach featuring his system against the King's Indian. And in the next video, I'd like to show you an insane game that I played against him. Um, yeah, really great fun. So let's have a look at this game. So this is Averbach against Oscar Pano played in the Argentina Soviet Union match in Buenos Aires in 1954. I just say, say he, he spoke very good English actually, Averbach. And and I think for that reason he he was um often 
sent abroad to, to tournaments by the Soviet Union. I think he was a kind of trusted pair of hands. They realised that he wasn't going to sort of upset things. Uh, he wasn't he wasn't a Korchnoi type character at all. You know, he he didn't like to rock the boat. That's my impression from his memoir anyway. It's a King's Indian and Bishop E2 and Bishop G5. So this became known as the Averbach system. It's the system that he developed himself and, um, well, employed with success. And it is very reliable. So what's the point of, of playing these bishops out very early? Um, well, this bishop covers these important squares. So white leads the knight on g1 for the time being, and that means that sometimes white can launch an attack with h4 and g4. Moving the bishop out to g5 is a provocative move. So what you're hoping to do is perhaps induce h6, and then you can you have something to bite on, perhaps with queen d2, gaining a tempo, Perhaps it'll just give you something, uh, a little hook where that'll allow white to open up a file. That's another uh, reason for inducing h6. So it's a slight weakness, basically. Uh, there's also a little trick here, of course, that if black plays the normal King's Indian move e5, then white will exchange and exchange here. And then there's trouble because knight d5 happens, and that wins material. So this was played in 1954, and you know at that time this was a pretty new system. So because of the difficulty in playing e5, Pano went to c5, <clears throat> which is you know one of the well reliable ways of meeting this system. And white closes with d5. And here Pano plays a6. Now you have to remember this is early days. Um, so, you know, well, it certainly wasn't known how black should tackle this system. Um, I mean, other moves here. e6 is possible. Um, e6... Well, that was played in a game, for example, between Carlsen and Van Veli. Just shows you if Carlsen is playing this, this was Vikonze 2013. If Carlsen is playing this, then you know this is a reliable system with White, and he crushed Van Veli. Very nice game, actually. I think I looked at it on this channel, actually. I'll have to look that up. If I, if I did, I'll post the link. Um... And you can also play h6. This was a game lay against Geary, played in 2022. Just shows how current it is. And queen d2, you can see you know, white gains a tempo against that pawn. Anyway, Pano played a6, a4, and went for queen a5. So the threat is to take here. Now queen d2 looks normal, but actually in this case, um, after queen d2, sometimes that queen can actually be quite annoying on b4. And Averbach played bishop d2, <clears throat> and I, I, and it seems curious to put the bishop on g5, then it comes all the way back again. But it makes life very uncomfortable for the queen. And I'm sure this is the kind of move that Averbach would have discovered in his preparation and realised it's a good move. Now, the normal move here is e6. So, for example, in a game between Gelfand and Nakamura, went like this, and then bishop g4. And this is a, a very normal kind of position that can be reached from the Averbach system, where white has the two bishops. So black has exchanged off the bishop, which just you can see in a closed position, this bishop doesn't have anything to do, really. So 
That's why Nakamura exchanged it off. And this is such a typical position with this pawn structure, locked pawn structure in the middle. And Averbach proved that, in fact, white does have some advantage here. And, you know, there, there are games where he managed to squeeze out a win using the space advantage and the bishops. Anyway, none of that happened. I just want to fill you in on the, the big picture. e5 played by Pano. And this is not the best continuation. So here's my question for you. How do you play here with white? White to play. I'll have a little slurp of tea. And appropriately, I've got my queen in Siberia mug, as black's queen appears to be in Siberia at the moment. And yes, one could exploit that by playing g4. The queen is miles away from the action. The queen side is not opening at all. And this is entirely appropriate to start expansion on the king side, which is basically just squashing black. If one can also attack at the same time, then that's good news. So h4 coming. So you can see that white has this massive space advantage. We've seen this in um, well, a video I posted a few weeks ago uh, regarding the Czech Bononi. So you can see we have a, a typical uh, pawn structure that could arise from a Czech Bononi. That, so it's it's very, very similar. You know, and, and personally, I always like to play this kind of way as white against um, King's Indian or Czech Bononi positions. You know, it's great fun to be able to attack Black's king. And Pano lashed out with f5. And, and, you know, if you don't, then Black is just getting squashed. Black has no play. I think it's interesting the way uh, Averbach tackles this. Because, you know, White can just do this. And even exchange here. I just play the knight out. Just play knight f3. And, you know, perhaps aim for this one. Perhaps rook g1, that's possible. Uh, one could also push with h5 as well, that's possible. Another way to play would be, instead of exchanging on f5, I like h5. Just push on, and the king is going to be in some trouble. But I think this is how Averbach plays this is very typical of his style. He doesn't really want to give black any counterplay at all. So he's just squashing black completely, doesn't feel the need to exchange pawns. And, and one point is this, by leaving this pawn on g4, leaving both these pawns, black will not be able to use the f5 square. So for example, I mean, this is not a good move. Um, but after this, you can see that this knight just looks fantastic on e4, and the pawn on g4 still covers the f5 square, so the bishop can't get into the game. Pano played f4 to you know, try to lock this bishop out from the, the king side, uh, trying to keep the position a little bit closed because you know the attack looks strong. But g5. So why g5? Well, if white manages to get in h6, then the bishop will be consigned to h8, and with a pawn in g5, it's just not getting out. It also frees the g4 square for the bishop as well. So that's why rook f <coughs> excuse me, that's why rook f7 was played in order to give the bishop a square here. Bishop g4 looks very nice. And the queen comes back here. Yeah, the queen was doing nothing on a5. And here it might be tempting to play bishop e6. Because after the exchange, then the knight comes into d5. But once again, I just have a... It, it's not really Averbach's style. He doesn't like to give his opponent any counterplay. And... You know, I have a feeling he might have been concerned 
perhaps at a later stage this knight could hop in here. Instead of playing bishop e6, he exchanged on c8 and just played knight f3. So everything is calm. He has complete control in this position. Black is not breaking on the queen side and he's squeezing nicely on the king side. Bishop f8, king e2, very nice. With the center closed, the king is perfectly safe on e2. Rook g7, well, this is all a bit desperate, but black wants to protect that pawn. And rook h4. So he's just preparing, doubling on the h file. Bishop b7, check here. And queen h6. So white has to somehow engineer a breakthrough here. Black's problem is that, um, well, he has no space. So the pieces are just treading on each other's toes here. And that's the problem when you have no space. No room to maneuver. So the knight drops back. And now rook h1. Now there is a point to this, <laughs> I have to say. Let's we're gonna see it in a second. So what is the point to playing like this? Pano, it's he's almost ready to sack a pawn. Even that wouldn't be terribly good. Uh, but that's what he's doing. But in fact, white is able to break through immediately. So you have a little think here. How did Averbach make the break in this position? He's obviously doing very well, and there are you know, there are several ways to, to try to proceed here, but this is absolutely crushing. He played bishop takes f4. So this is why the rook has come over here. More than just to emphasize his control of the, the rook's file. And if this is taken, then rook here and rook takes f4 and... Well, black just collapses there. So bishop f4 just played. Queen c7. Queen back. It would still be completely winning if black took. And now Averbach simply wants to take here. Knight d7 protects this pawn. But now queen h3. This is very nice maneuvering. Threatening queen e6 mate. The knight goes back. And now he closes in for the kill. So if bishop takes, that's actually checkmate. That's very nice. So king takes and queen e6, threatening rook h8. Knight h4. So this one is coming in here. Bishop d8, knight takes g6. And here, Pano resigned. Well, white pieces are just crashing through there. Um, but, well, what an advert for the Averbach system. Um, there, there are some very deep ideas there, actually. And I, and I think it's this kind of move. Bishop d2, that's the kind of move which must have shaken Pano. Um, you know, it's it's... Very unusual to retreat the bishop, but it's a very strong move indeed, and and is that yeah is the normal move here in this position. You know, even decades later, you know, I mentioned that this game Gelfand against Nakamura, which went like this. You know, that was London 2013, played well 60 years, almost 60 years after this game, and Bishop D2 is still being played. That shows the depth of Averbach's ideas and. Yes, he understood very well the power of this squeeze on the king side. I want to show you another game by Averbach in the next video. And it'll be my game against him, uh, which was tremendous fun. And I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, the man himself, um, because I, I really enjoyed my discussions with him. And he was a fascinating man. Hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for watching.